Hello and welcome to Concordia Today. I'm Jacqueline Liu. And I'm Lori Graham. Stay tuned for an interview later on in the show with Jessica Brown from CFLI Radio and a report on why students choose Concordia. But first, the news. Students have fewer choices in the upcoming student government elections. Only five candidates are running for the paid position of president for Concordia Student Union. Last year, there were five presidential wannabes and three rounds of voting. CSU officials point to a lack of controversy in student, student politics this year as a reason for the decline in nominations. Others have said that the low turnout is due to a short nomination period and little advance notice to potential runners. This month, Concordia students will be voting on having their own Bill of Rights. It outlines a student's rights and responsibilities within the university. If passed, students will have a written document to refer to all the time. Jennifer Goldfinch has more. These students never had a Bill of Rights. Alexandra Flynn explains how having one can benefit today's students. Using something that happened last year with the industrial engineering students regarding curriculum. In the Bill of Rights, under a specific clause, it says that if adequate information regarding the course isn't provided, then a student can appeal. Voting on the Bill of Rights takes place on March 28th, 29th, and 30th. For Concordia Today, I'm Jennifer Goldfinch. If students vote yes, the Bill of Rights will be passed on to Concordia Senate and Board of Governors for revisions. In other news, former Rector Patrick Kenneth was paid $580,000 to leave Concordia last spring. This according to documents made public by Concordia's administration last week. Under the deal, Kenneth is getting his salary, the use of his leased Volvo until May, and $400,000. As part of the agreement, Kenneth signed a document saying he would not sue the university for firing him. In return, the university would not sue Kenneth for any of his actions as rector. University officials said that steps have been taken to ensure that overly hefty separation packages are not repeated with other top administrators. In Quebec alone, 1,400 pints of blood are needed per day. But the cloud of controversy surrounding the Red Cross is bleeding their organization dry. Rita Cotia has more. Last week, the Engineering and Computer Science Department sponsored a two-day Red Cross blood drive at Concordia. Their goal was to collect 250 units of blood per day. But by the end of the first day, they only gathered 99. Last year's mezzanine location attracted more passers-by. This year, it was held behind the seventh floor cafeteria. Christine Vieira is one of the student coordinators. She believes a negative student campaign also attributed to the low turnout. I see this, this boycott or this, this desire to stop people to give, uh, giving blood, I call it, for me, it's morally reprehensible and it's blackmail. The people that want to receive the blood are the ones that are going to be hurt. Concordia's Queer Collective believes the questionnaire is not a fair or accurate way of screening infected blood. I don't think that student unions should be sponsoring organizations that discriminate and promote stereotypes. The Red Cross says the questionnaire is necessary to ensure a safe blood supply. For Concordia Today, I'm Rita Katsia. It's spring again in Montreal, and that means blooming flowers, singing birds, and stolen bikes. While the first two are welcome signs of spring, Concordia Security wants to eliminate theft. They plan to offer safety awareness workshops for students at the downtown campus. Security is also proposing the installation of bike racks behind the hall building and identification numbers that are engraved on students' bikes. These measures will make it easier for police to identify a recovered bike. During the summer, an average of three bikes a week are reported stolen around the hall building. Radio Free Vestibule. No, it's not a cheap closet at Shome FM. It's just three guys making a living having a lot of fun. They've just released a new CD so they can share that fun with audiences nationwide. Lauren McCallum entered the comedy closet and tried to get one straight answer from these three talented men. Uh, the concept of time. <laughs> the concept of time. That dog over there? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> this is good acid, eh? <laughs> it's a CD, but it's not music. It's comedy, and it's funny. It's radio-free vestibule. Being performers on stage, why do you think, you know, what's with the CD? It's a nothing um, to do with that answer. No, uh, it's a serious answer. Yeah. I want to answer this go. one. Go ahead. Jank, go ahead. Um, <laughs> we'll jump in if we screw up, though. Okay. Uh, 
reached the team here is the this is the part where we play real hard it's much louder than at the beginning then we go back to the quiet part what made you come out with a cd we thought we could put all our best radio material on a CD. <laughs> That's a period. <laughs> Bernard, Terrence, and Paul are all Concordia graduates from the communications department. They've been entertaining audiences now for seven years. Yes, Casper Oboot does some of your favorite songs in French, like the Beatles' Hello, Goodbye. I would like very much for you to purchase me. I will bring you hours of enjoyment and funny laughs in your house. Can we hear the CD? Yeah, you just did. <laughs> <laughs> what do you call a radio-free vestibule CD? 70 minutes of laser sharp humor. For Concordia Today, I'm Lauren McCallum. Local artist Mark Prent is making waves again, only this time it's not because of his art. Prent, a part time technician in the fine arts department, is in hot water because a student made a complaint about his assistant. He is charged with telling the student what to write and was suspended for two days without pay earlier this semester. But Prent says he only told the student where to send his complaint. Concordia's Technicians Union has taken up his case and has since offered to restore his lost pay. But a letter of suspension will remain on his file. Unsatisfied, Prent is taking the university to arbitration. Young people living in downtown areas are often in need of direction or role models. Concordia's Inner City Youth Project is answering that need. Sponsored by the Department of Leisure Studies, the program brings together 65 student counselors with over 400 adolescents. They participate in everything from athletics to art classes. Katie Schmidt has this report. Concordia's Inner City Youth Program gives young people a chance to try new activities in a safe and structured environment. It also lets them look to student counselors as role models and friends. Concordia student Ruan Kent explains. At the same time, I think it has a greater impact on my life and how I look at uh, you know, adolescents in general, uh, forming maybe a closer affinity with some of their problems instead of, you know, branding them or classifying them as, you know, just adolescent problems. The program is offered before and after school, and participants are bused in from around the Montreal area. The activities are a boon to young people looking for direction, and they give Concordia students a chance to gain valuable job experience. They're benefited, they're getting some experience, they're getting feedback and evaluation. And so when they go out into the job force, they can say, yes, I'm go you know, I have experience working with youth. The youth who participate in our programs, for a lot of them, the services we offer are the only formal or structural um, programs that they have. The inner city youth program will run until the end of March. It'll start up again in September if funding is available. Recent cutbacks have put the program in jeopardy, and coordinators are currently searching for corporate support. For Concordia Today, I'm Katie Schmidt. Concordia alumni dug deep into their pockets, raising more than $100,000 at their seventh annual Fornathon last week. The money will go to scholarships, fellowships, and the improvement of lab facilities. Organizers said that fundraisers have become more common due to constant cuts to the university's budget. The Fornathon was a success, making $8,000 more than last year. For the 11th year in a row, Concordia was host to the Inter-University Bridge Building Competition. More than 39 teams from Canada and the United States participated in the bridge bashing event. Marie-Lène Guévremont has this report. They built him just to break him. The bridges were made out of toothpicks, dental floss, glue and popsicle sticks. The winning bridge withstood over 1,500 pounds of pressure. According to the winner, there's only one key to success. Work, work, work. <laughs> but there is only one way to make the crowds cheer. 
For Concordia Today, I'm Marilyn Gavremont. And in sports, the Stingers clinched second place at the National Basketball Championships last week in Halifax. The Alberta Golden Bears beat Concordia 84-66. to It's the Golden Bears' second win in a row. Ooh, better luck next time, guys. Stay tuned for an interview with Jessica Brown from CFLI Radio and a report on why you chose Concordia. That's the news for this week. I'm Lori Graham. And I'm Jacqueline Liu. Thanks for watching. Heart disease and stroke are Canada's number one killer. Your donations fund education and medical advances that save more lives each year. Thanks to research, he has a pacemaker. She has a grandfather. Help give someone a second chance. Please give generously to the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Concordia. It was established in 1974 when Loyola College and Sir George Williams University merged into one. Located in Montreal, it has two campuses. One, Sir George in downtown Montreal. The other, Loyola in residential West End Montreal. Over 25,000 people are enrolled at Concordia. Students obtain their degrees from four separate faculties, arts and science, commerce and administration, engineering and computer science, and fine arts. There are over 180 distinct subject areas for them to choose from. 94% of students are Quebecers. 3% come from the other provinces. The remaining 3% are international students. But why did they choose Concordia? Was it the fine cuisine? The beautiful maroon shuttle buses? or maybe the interesting art found on the campuses. Why did you choose Concordia? I don't know, why did I choose Concordia? Am I on? You are. Ah. It seems to me, I've not gone to any other university, so for me it was first choice, it's close location. And the program it offers, which is political science, is, um, how can I say, uh, perhaps less, um, Books are packed with students, like the courses are not with 500 students, but 50 students. So um, it's easier to communicate with the teachers and the student body. Well, I started uh, studying part-time in 89, and I was gearing towards the arts. I'm in the fine arts, and I heard that it was uh, one of the better universities in the art faculty. I'm a mature student, so, uh, and also they have a very good uh, fine arts department. I was interested in uh, sculpture. With, uh, education sculpture and I just went there really. Um, well I chose Concordia because because I didn't want to go to McGill. <laughs> That's ridiculous. No because I really like Montreal and I didn't want to go to McGill and because Concordia seems like a laid-back sort of nice place to be. Well, I chose Concordia because uh, it's close to where I live, essentially, and also because it had a good reputation for the program I was choosing, uh, film production. Okay, well, I chose Concordia because I only applied at two universities. Uh, McGill. <laughs> no chance. As an undergraduate, I chose it because of its reputation for um, catering to mature students. I came back to school as a mature student after working for seven years. I also like the idea of the smaller classes. Um, when I was looking at universities in Montreal, I compared Concordia's classes, classroom size, to other classes. And the idea of coming back as a mature student to university and, and going into a room with 350 students was a bit intimidating. So that's why I chose Concordia. I'm in communication studies, and it's uh, one of the most reputable programs in Canada. It's the best places to come here. Well, I chose Concordia because um, it's a good education. Are you satisfied with Concordia? Ah, definitely. Overtired. I need 72 hours <laughs> to do everything. Uh, well, there's definite problems with the administration and budget and stuff, but uh, I say I've learned something, I guess, but uh, there's definitely a lot of problems. Uh, not just with my faculty, I guess, although there's definitely problems with 
film production faculty. But uh, yeah, so it's okay, but there's definitely problems. Yeah, the urban planning department should get more funding though, but it's uh, all the courses and everything is are really, really sort of on the pulse of things, and especially with our projects and stuff like that. Oh yeah, I think it's a great university. I've been very happy. I'm a graduate student here now. I'm about to finish my PhD. And I'm going to Harvard to do a postdoc, so I feel like my education has been really good. I've met uh, good students. I've had uh, good mentors at the, at the graduate level. So yeah, in general, I'm happy with it. Um, I'm sort of lost in Concordia. I don't, <laughs> I, I don't see, I don't know. It's my first semester, and I really don't know what goes on here. I mean, at CJP, I knew where everyone was, but I come here and everyone's here or there, or like downtown, or I just, I'm lost. Yeah, I am. I mean, like I said, there, there are problems. I mean, financially, there's not as much equipment, or we're not able to get everything that, that we feel we, we deserve to get. But overall, I'm, I'm learning a lot. I like it. What would you change about Concordia if you could? Uh, it should be a more lively school. Like, it should have more student activities. Uh, just conglomerate all the faculties together, not just separate like ECA and CASA and everything, just have everything in like one organization. You got me there. Um, I I'm satisfied. There's nothing really to complain about so far. There's, it's been okay. I've been, like I said, since 89 and uh, it's been okay. Um, what would I change about it? Oh. <laughs> what would I change? What would I change? Well, you can't change much because there's no money anymore, do they? Uh, well, it's personal, but I would. I, I, the, ir the the shuttle bus irritates me. If I could somehow have everything more centralized, I would, uh, I would prefer it. Um, maybe some of the administration uh, uh, policies or the way things work. Sometimes I find it um, could be long and redundant or. I don't know, I see things that are being wasted or things that could be used more in an efficient way. It's, it's hard to say. I would change the hall building. <laughs> I'd get rid of the hall building. I think we should have a terrace out here. A hive should have a terrace right there and where it's, everyone can sit down, congregate, and get drunk and have a good time. I give us a, a better reputation compared to McGill. Does its motto, real education for the real world, ring true? Uh. <laughs> well, I find it difficult to say because I'm not in the real world yet, so uh, I'd have to wait and see and come back to you on that. I'm Cynthia Manzo from Concordia Today. Hi, and welcome back to the program. I'm Anik Yusti, and joining me today is Jessica Brown, who is CFLI's station manager. Welcome, Jessica. Thanks for having me. Perhaps you could tell us just a bit what uh, CFLI is about. Uh, CFLI is a student-run radio station, one of two stations at Concordia. Uh, we're based at the Loyola campus, and it's um, an educational system for students, basically students who want to get into broadcasting, uh, to be a disc jockey or to go into sales, management, um, any of those positions in major market radio, we uh, are a sort of a training ground. A lot of Montreal DJs have uh, started off at Seafly and have gone on, so it's, it's a good experience for most students. And is the executive a paid staff? Nobody's paid, everybody's a volunteer. Most of the executives are communication students or people who are trying to get into communications. They have a lot of either experience in radio or uh, you know, just more enthusiastic, have a lot of interest in helping out. Mm -hmm. But all of the students that work there, there's about 100 staff, they're all volunteers. And do you have peers that'll help the students out, such, such as members of the executive? Uh, sure, the executives are there just about every afternoon. Um, students, I mean, there's DJs coming in, there's basically two hour or three hour shifts. So the DJs change every three hours. And uh, that way we get to hire more students to give them more experience, basically. So if we limited it to longer shifts and less students, we'd have to you know, turn away more students and stuff. But we're always there for students if they need help or 
you know, if they want to uh, ask questions about radio and stuff. Mm -hmm. And what type of programming do you have at CFLI? Um, our mandate, our format is college rock. So basically, we're, I mean, we sort of fit in a different groove than other radio stations. It's not, I wouldn't call it classic rock, I wouldn't call it alternative or like top 40. We're sort of, I mean, a lot of re, uh, music companies send us music that before they send it to major market radio stations, they sort of try it out on the college stations. So we sort of, not an alternative sound at all. It's more of like a, a good college rock that you wouldn't hear on a lot of the radio stations because either they're, you know, they think it's a little too out there and stuff, but a lot of uh, listeners like it. Mm -hmm. And do you have any news on the station? Yes, our news is broadcast twice a day, uh, noon and 3.30, and it's done by the Concordia Journalism Department under Bob McDevitt. And um, I think we're on almost every day, four days a week, Monday to Thursday. And uh, yeah, they, they cover news for us. It's a, pretty much a separate department. They do their own thing, and we broadcast them twice a day live. Where, where can we hear you broadcasting? Mm -hmm. Uh, at the Loyola campus, you can hear us. Both residences have transmitters, so we have a lot of our listeners in residence. We have uh, the Bryan Building is hooked up, as well as the campus center under the cafeteria and in the campus shop. And um, sometimes you can hear us downtown at in the Mez Cafe or in Reggie's because they have the option to hook us up. And the VA building, I believe, also has a transmitter, but I'm not positive mm -hmm. on that. Other than that, you can hook us up on, on cable. It's 101.9 Videotron or 88.5 CF cable. And it's basically you have to get a splitter to split your cable, and you put one into your radio and one into your TV. You could do it with any radio station. It's like a TV. It gives you clear reception, or you can also pick up other stations. Okay. But we can't hear you just on regular FM airwaves. No, we don't have an FM license as of yet. Um, we're in the process of making an application for an FM license, which hopefully we'll be presenting to the CRTC in September. But it's a long and drawn out process and involves a lot of money and stuff mm -hmm. and funding, which we don't have at present. Right. And how do you plan on funding this? Well, um, I mean, because we're part of, still part of Concordia, uh, we're hoping that Concordia will give us some money or at least donate a space for us because, as you know, they're planning on taking down the Centennial Building, which is mm -hmm. one of our, which is where our space is located right now. But they've guaranteed that they'll give us other space. So um, other than that, right now we're in application for a tax number, which will allow us to have people donate tax uh, reductions that can give us do charitable donations mm -hmm. in return for a tax reduction. OK. But this hasn't started yet. Uh, no, it's in the process. Right now we're still looking for sponsors. It's like smaller businesses to run ads and we'll put up their banners at our, uh, at our um, concerts and at our movie premieres. Okay. So. Now if students want to become involved, do they need special qualifications? No. That's, I mean, basically that's our mandate. Of our, we get our FM license. We'll still be an educational station, mm -hmm. which is a new thing for the CRTC because I think there's only a few other stations across Canada that have an educational license. So basically, it will still be for students to train uh, as it is now. Like, we have students from all different programs, you know, nobody specific. Um, anybody who's interested, basically, can get involved. I mean, even if you don't want to do on-air work, uh, we have, you know, several different positions that are always open, and we're always looking for volunteers to help us out for any of our, our activities and stuff. Apart from on-air, what can people do, though, um, Well, aside from the management positions, which I mean, if you have extra time, we put in about a good 15, 20 hours a week in management, uh, which is a great experience because you, I mean, as station manager, I am like in charge of the goings on within the station. So that would mean like all the staff members assuring that all the other executives are doing their positions properly, mm -hmm. uh, that we're getting music, that, you know, everything is running smoothly, we're de dealing with funds. Um, you could also, there's sales, we're always looking for people to do, well, we're calling it sponsorship now because mm -hmm. we're trying to like make a different angle on it. Um, there's a music department which handles like all of the music which we get in. We get in about, I would say, 50 to 100 CDs, you know, every two weeks. So there's like constant changeover of music, um, programming, logs have to be done. There's just tons of stuff needing to be done. If you know anything about equipment, you know, we always need people to help out fixing equipment and stuff. Okay, and where can people reach you? Um, well, we're at the Centennial Building, which is, if you know where Mr. Hot Dog is, most people who've ever been to Loyola campus know Mr. Hot Dog. It's about two buildings east of Mr. Hot Dog. So like you get off the shuttle bus, you walk towards Mr. Hot Dog, and you'll see we have a big white sign outside the Seafly Radio Concordia. It's in the same building as the Concordian newspaper. And um, just come in. We're open 
pretty much 24 hours a day. Okay. Um, sometimes we're not open overnight, but for the most part, and you can come in and fill in an application. Great. Well, thanks a lot, Jessica. No problem. And that's all the time we have for today, but join us next week. I'm Anna QCA.
Hello and welcome to Concordia Today. I'm Jacqueline Liu. And I'm Sherry Claridge. Coming up later in the show, we'll have an interview with John Dorr, head coach of the Concordia men's basketball team. We'll also have a report on the Loyola Daycare Center. But first, the news. Concordia students may have to pay more to get less. The three finalists in Concordia's search for a new rector agree that tuition hikes seem inevitable. The university must slash $10 million from its budget next year, half because of funding cuts from the Quebec government and half due to reduced enrollment and the university's huge debt. Dr. Donald Baker is currently Vice President Academic at Wilfrid Laurier University in Ontario. He suggested that an average tuition increase of $277 per student would offset provincial cuts. The other two candidates agreed and added that active efforts must be made to recruit good students. By this they mean foreign students who pay higher tuition fees and graduate students who draw more government funding. The end of the school year is in sight and the annual summer job hunt is just heating up. Paul God examines the prospects for Concordia students. The signs of spring are everywhere and they spell good news for job hunting students. Some of those signs are at Concordia's Career and Placement Service or CAPS. Here, students can take advantage of many services to help them find a job. Denise Beamish is one of more than 3,000 students who register with CAPS each year. I think, though, you have to do more than just look at the board. And something that they stress in their workshops and when you talk to them is tapping into the hidden job market, um, networking, uh, those kinds of things. All the signs point to students like Denise having an easier time finding employment this summer. Colleen Bronson is a placement officer with CAPS. Since January of 1994, in other words, the last uh, 16 months, the job opportunities have just skyrocketed. So finally, the economic comeback uh, that we keep reading about and hearing about is starting to translate into jobs. So certainly, the opportunities for the students are increasing, and the quality of the jobs are increasing. So there are a lot more professional-type jobs. Back at the job board, Denise has found a hot prospect. Uh, le groupe de levée de fonds universal. Hire me. <laughs> Students looking for a part-time job or a full-time career can register with Concordia Career and Placement Service. It's located at 2070 Mackay, across from the Hall Building downtown. This is Paul Gott for Concordia Today. The Career and Placement Service will be hosting a second career day this year at Concordia. Called Wired, it will concentrate on the influence of new technologies on all types of jobs. It will be held in the Hall Building mezzanine on April 5th. The Concordia Student Union election campaign is underway. Up, up for grabs are the position of president and 30 seats on the Council of Representatives. There are five candidates running for president. They are Jonathan Carruthers, Raymond Hall, Lana Grimes, Lee Pemberton, and Christos Cardiogiannis. The election takes place from March 28th through the 30th. The winning candidates take office June 1st. But student government isn't the only thing being voted on. They're holding a referendum to decide whether or not to become part of the Canadian Federation of Students. The CFS is an alliance of 65 student associations that lobbies federal and provincial governments. Those in the faculties of Fine Arts and Arts and Science are eligible to vote in the referendum because they are members of Concordia's Students' Union. If the referendum passes, students will pay an additional $3 fee per semester. Concordia students will also be voting to approve their own Bill of Rights. The bill outlines fundamental rights and freedoms. Some include academic rights, freedom from discrimination and unwanted sexual practices, and freedom of expression, opinion, and peaceful assembly. A group of leisure studies students wanted to mix charity with coursework. As part of a class requirement, they produced a fashion show and donated the entire proceeds to the Children's Wish Foundation. Thomas Mall was there. It's an opportunity to see what the fashionable will be wearing next season. During this benefit show, the Leisure Studies students wanted to give us a peek at some of the fun and some of the sun coming up this summer. Modeling and production for this event was done by the students as a final project for a class at Concordia. The name of the fashion show tonight? To fulfill a dream. And that's what the Leisure Studies students have done raising $1,200 to bring dreams to kids. For Concordia Today, I'm Thomas Mall. Some Concordia Fine Arts students found a way to show their work outside the university in a real gallery for next to nothing. Adriana Brasiliero explains. Sexuality. Childhood. 
political statements. Multiculturalism. There was a bit of everything at the art opening organized by 18 fine arts students in a graduating drawing class. For only $14 each, the students rented the space for two weeks at ArtCore, a new alternative gallery in town. The show gives students a chance to be recognized in the real art scene. For Concordia Today, this is Adriana Brasileiro. ArtCore is located at 265 St. Antoine West. For more information, call 277-7599. And in other news, it doesn't pay to get sick at Concordia. Monique Deschamps lost her job as a technician in the ceramics, fibers, and sculpture department after taking a leave of absence due to illness in the fall semester. She had worked for the university for eight years and had planned on returning to her job in January. But when 1995 rolled around, the university informed her that the technician that had replaced her for four months was there to stay. The university has argued that Deschamps is a seasonal employee and works under a renewable contract. Therefore, there was no guarantee that she would get her job back. Deschamps has filed two grievances against the university. Tuesday night is Folk Night at the Hive, the Loyola Campus Center pub. The event is a chance for amateur musicians to take advantage of an open mic and to show off their acoustic talents. Katie Schmidt has this report. It's Tuesday night, and that means a chance for those bloody nodules to get up and perform. But just because they're up on stage doesn't mean they're confident. Nervous, nervous, nervous. Nervous, nervous. <laughs> but we don't show it. But yeah, we don't. We try not to show it. Try not to show it. We never let them see us sweat. <laughs> That's even harder when it's your first time on stage. A common occurrence on open mic night. But in the end, it's all about music, not lack of experience. Folk night runs every Tuesday at the Hive. So if you know of any undiscovered talent walking the halls of Concordia, get them to come on out and share their stuff with an appreciative audience. They've got till the end of the term. For Concordia Today, I'm Katie Schmidt. Concordia's got a well-known professor teaching creative writing these days. But Neil Bisundat is more than just a teacher. He also writes books. His latest one was a first try attempt at nonfiction. The bestseller caused a controversy because it attacked our government's $29 million multiculturalism policy. With more, here's Diane Kuzian. Neil Bisundath is a writer who doesn't mince words. His most recent book, Selling Illusions, The Cult of Multiculturalism, created a backlash against him by advocates of the government policy. Where it did become a little unsettling was when people started calling me racist names. Uh, on national television, I was called a coconut by, a, by one man. Brown on the outside and white on the inside. It seems that you cannot question a policy like multiculturalism without people calling you names. In the book, he criticizes the government for encouraging ethnic differences instead of promoting a common Canadian identity. The idea that we are in all in one way or another victims of one kind or another that we all have to retreat behind protective walls of some kind. And in Canada, the protective walls that we seem to have legitimized tend to be ethnic ones. Critics say Bisundaf isn't qualified to write about multiculturalism, but he says he speaks from experience. It does not help us growing up and living in this country and creating lives in this country to see other Canadians who may be different from us in color or religion or language as simply other Canadians, but it helps us to see each other as hyphenated Canadians. I have real problems with the hyphenation because I'm not sure what it means. I've been called um, a Trinidadian uh, Canadian, a West Indian Canadian. I don't know what those things mean. I left the Caribbean over 20 years ago. For Concordia Today, I'm Diane Cousian. That's the news for this week. Stay tuned for an interview with John Doerr, head coach for men's basketball, and a report on the Loyola Campus Daycare Center. For Concordia Today, I'm Jacqueline Liu. And I'm Sherry Claridge. Thanks for watching. Heart disease and stroke are Canada's number one killer. 
Your donations fund education and medical advances that save more lives each year. Thanks to research, he has a pacemaker. She has a grandfather. Help give someone a second chance. Please give generously to the Heart and Stroke Foundation. I'm presently at Loyola's daycare center, La Garderie Les Petits Profs. This daycare provides um, care for small children while their parents are studying or working at Concordia University. This daycare center is located on Belmer Street, right next to Vanier Library. There are 48 children between the ages of three months and five years. They are all separated in groups of five with children of their age. to play with your friends here? Yeah. You have a lot of friends at the daycare center? Yeah, it's very fun playing with them. Very fun? Yeah, and, um, and we also clean them when it's time to clean up. I met the director of the daycare center, Mrs. Susan Evans. I asked her what is the philosophy of the daycare. I guess our hope is that we provide a home-like atmosphere uh, for the children. We want it to be a very family-oriented daycare center um, that provides a home away from home, if you will, for working parents and studying parents of the university. And uh, basically that we focus in on all aspects of the child's development, the cognitive, social, emotional, and physical needs of the young child. That's our mandate. <laughs> A full-time cook works for the daycare center. She prepares lunch during the day, as well as snacks in the morning and in the afternoon. I cook, I prepare the lunches for the children, I make the menus, I shop for them, I see what is better for them to eat, and I have to consider younger children that they are from six months they start eating to five years old. And I have to check also allergies. We have children with allergies, which is Sometimes quite, um, you have to think very carefully your menu. We have children that are allergic to nuts, to citrus, to lactose. They have lactose intolerance. So we have to be very careful with our menus. What about the teachers? Are they qualified? Yes, actually all, all of the educators here are qualified. They either have an attestation, a DEC, or a university degree in early childhood. And um, I mean, definitely for the baby room, it's a different type of skills that, that you're looking for in a baby room educator. Very, very nurturing um, character. Uh, and there's a lot of staffing in the infant room. We have two teachers rather than one teacher in that group. We do activities that promote cognitive, physical, creative development and outdoor play as well as activities inside such as art and uh, drama and uh, cooking activities and stuff like that. They try to balance structured activities with free choice activities and active play with quiet play. Can you say mama? Mama. Yes. Can you say dada? Mama. Parents are very happy with the daycare. I think it would be a real loss to the university if, uh, if the daycares were closed. It's, uh, it's a tremendous service. Really, it, workplace daycare is, uh, is the ideal for the parent because the parent, particularly of very young children, feel so much safer and so much more connected with their child if their child is physically close to them. Do you think it's essential to have a daycare center for a, a university? Yeah, I really do. 
I think it provides, because we have a lot of parents who are students, and I think it gives them the opportunity to get their education, which is really important today. All the parents are connected with the university. 50% are non-academic staff, 25% students, 25% faculty. And what about the cost? For this year, uh, it's $22 a day to have your child in our infant room and $21 a day in all of the other rooms. Uh, parents who are below a certain family income can apply for government subsidy and uh, for students particularly, this is over and above the loans and bursaries that they get. This is an, an added um, amount of money just for their child in daycare. Are you affiliated with the daycare center downtown? Uh, we're not really affiliated. We're both government subsidized nonprofit corporations that run completely independently of each other. But there is uh, enough business for both of us that we're certainly not in competition. So we have, we have a relationship because the director of that daycare and I have a relationship. But legally, there's really no connection. You receive some money from the university also? Yes, we do. Yes, we do. We receive money from uh, the university, and we also receive from the provincial government. Care Center. I'm Alexandra Pagé for Concordia Today. Welcome back to the show. I'm Sherry Claridge. My guest today is John Doerr, head coach of the Concordia men's basketball team. Welcome, John. Thank you, Sherry. Nice to be here. Thank you. Um, congratulations, first off, on a successful season. The team played some great basketball throughout the year, as well as in the tournament in Halifax. What would you attribute this success to? I think that we have good people in the basketball program, first of all. Uh, you know, I think when we're recruiting, we look for good citizens, those who can be successful academically, and then those who can be successful athletically. And I think the work ethic also has a lot to do with it. Uh, unlike maybe some other schools, we expect to win. Uh, other schools might hope to win. And are there any special techniques that you use in your coaching to get the team to gel? I think there's a, a number of different things we do. Uh, we break games down into the smallest situations possible. And when we practice early in the year, we might scrimmage for 10 minutes. And by the end of the year, we're having five minute, three minute, or one minute scrimmages and going into special situations. And Hopefully when the game is on the line and you go through these things a uh, hundred times before, uh, everybody knows what to do and uh, the team will gel. And is there any special coaching techniques that you use? H how would you describe your coaching style? I'd say primarily a player's coach. Uh, I want the players to have fun when they're playing. Uh, we try to, I, I guess I would describe it as that I teach, I create, and I motivate. And, uh, and I want the players to enjoy playing. And uh, that's why that, uh, you know, there's no scholarships at Concordia University, athletic scholarships. and. Uh, they're there because they enjoy it. We want to make it enjoyable for them, yet we want them to get the most out of their ability that they can. So a player's coach, uh, let them have some fun and let them run up and down and uh, play the style of game that they like. You talked about motivation. How important, in your opinion, are pre-game pep talks? In, in my opinion, pre-game pep talks are not very important at all. It's uh, more in the preparation. It's like going into a final exam. If you feel you've prepared well going into the exam, you're going to do well. You try to cram in the end, and it's not going to work. So uh, as long as you've covered all the bases going in and, uh, and you're well prepared, uh, you'll feel good about yourself, and you'll be successful. Do you usually tend to give the team a pep talk anyway? Well, I would say it's more that we review what we've 
taught and gone over in the other team and what we would like to do and the things that might make us successful on that particular day. And it varies according to the teams you play. Uh, I mean, occasionally we'll give a pep talk, you know, a so-called pep talk, you know, uh, putting everything on the line and uh, trying to excel, trying to give 100%, 100% of the time, things of that nature. But that, that's more an individual thing. And I, I think that's uh, throughout the course of the year you teach that. So it's not necessary to do it at the last minute. If a coach wants to win more than the uh, athletes on the team, something's wrong. <laughs> if you had to single out one player in particular <laughs> of your team who would be noted for their talents and their, uh, their ability, basically, who would you say that is and why? Well, that's a very tough question. Tough question. Uh, we had four guys that averaged between 14 and 16.7 points a game this year. Our fifth player was uh, Dustin Tadvyskis, who was from British Columbia. And he was the guy that most unselfish player maybe we've ever had at Concordia. So he's the guy that gave him the ball. Uh, it's tough. But I guess if we did have to single out one, it would be Emerson Thomas. He's in his fifth year. He was honorable mention All-Canadian in his uh, third and fourth years. And he's second team All-Canadian this year. Uh, Emerson was our, our leader. Our, he led through example, uh, inspiration, uh, work ethic. Uh, Sort of just did, did everything. He's also in graduate school. He's a good student. He's, uh, he's up for male athlete, athlete of the year in Canada. Uh, next week in uh, Calgary, there'll be a dinner, and he's one of six finalists. Uh, I guess he's the, he's the one person that we could single out as sort of epitomizing the basketball program at Concordia. And not just because of what he's done on the court, what he's done in, in academically and mm -hmm. the community work that he's done over the years. And uh, we, we do a lot of clinics for high school kids. You have kids in practice all the time. And uh, Emerson is always there to speak to him. And uh, he's the one person. I'm just wondering, do you encourage high standards in academics as well as um, good players, for instance? Do you have some sort of a program that might coordinate the two to help your students along? Well, we do. I mean, we have a student athlete academic assistance program, mm -hmm. SASP, uh, and Anna Johansson uh, is in charge of that. And she does a tremendous job of monitoring the individual's progress and helping them organize their time and study skills, particularly for first year student athletes. And making the jump from a high school to CJEP to university is, uh, is a big adjustment for most of them. And she's great with that. Uh, I also monitor their progress. And uh, I mean, we have left players home from uh, championship games, we left players home from league games because of a conflict with their classes or they're not doing well in school or whatever the case might be. I think that academics have to come first. And I think that in the basketball program, I think over the years, that's one of the, the selling points of the program is that in six years, I said almost every athlete we've had has graduated. There's one who hasn't finished yet and he'll be finished this year. And then we'll have a 100% graduation rate, which is probably unheard of in, hmm. in most institutions. Yeah. And what would you say makes this year's team different as opposed to other teams in the past? Well, I, I guess the, the one thing that would make this team different is probably the most athletic team that we've ever had and potentially the best team we've ever had. I mm -hmm. don't think it ever came together the way the team did in 1990 when we won the national championship. But potentially this was a, the upside was far greater with this team. Uh, like all the teams we had, I think the one team that makes the basketball team at Concordia a little unique, and uh, maybe men's and women's, is that the ethnic diversity on the team is reflected in the ethnic diversity in the university. And I don't think any of the other sports have that. And, uh, that's kind of special the way we're able to bring people from uh, different backgrounds together to, yeah. to go after the same uh, the goals and tasks. Now here's a question that everybody is wondering about. Describe the rivalry between McGill and Concordia. Is there a rivalry between oh, McGill and Concordia? Oh, I'd say so. Well, in the last uh, six years, McGill has only beaten us twice. So I guess that uh, because they're across town and the, the guys know each other and play against each other all summer long as well as uh, during the year, there is a bit of a, bit of a rivalry. Uh, they caught us once this year uh, a little bit flat. and. Uh, they beat us in overtime at McGill. I guess it just goes back to the uh, proximity of the two universities and uh, McGill being sort of up on the hill and maybe Concordia on the other side of the tracks. Uh, mm -hmm. But that, you know, the rivalry, it's a personal thing with the players and the athletes, and they know each other. And uh, 
McGill has a few players from Quebec, not too many, and most of our players are from Quebec. So uh, I, that, that's it. I, I don't think it's any anything to get too excited about. Uh, people in the community get more excited than the athletes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's all for today. I'm Sherry Claridge, and our guest today was John Doerr, head coach of the Concordia men's basketball team. Thanks for watching.
Hi, and welcome to Concordia Today. I'm Anik UC. And I'm Sherry Claridge. Later in the show, we'll have a report on the Hive and Reggie's, Concordia's two bars. But first, the news. Native writer Thompson Highway is best known as an award-winning playwright. His works, The Res Sisters and Dry Lips Auto Move to Capus Casing, were nominated for the Governor General's Award. But this year, he's also Concordia's writer-in-residence. Tanya Churchmuch has more. As writer-in-residence, Thompson Highway spends his days reading and critiquing Concordia students' creative works. And I advise them, I, I sort of try to help them, uh, set them on a, on a critical path, sort of, whereby they can make the uh, work better, show them different techniques, different tricks of the trade, so to speak. He also gives guest lectures to Concordia classes on everything from playwriting to ethnic relations. But most importantly, Thompson Highway wants students to understand the importance of writing. It's just very um, enriching to be able to articulate clearly, to, you know, to be articulate, to be, uh, it's, you know, there are certain muscles of, of, the, of your mind, of your mental, your intellectual being that you sharpen, that you develop, you know, like, you just like exercising your body, you know. Concordia's theater department will be presenting Thompson Highway's play, The Res Sisters, from March 31st until April 9th. For ticket information, dial 848-4742. For Concordia Today, I'm Tanya Churchmuch. The search for a new Concordia rector is over. Dr. Frederick Lowey was officially appointed as rector last Wednesday. Lowey will serve a five-year term beginning on August 15th. He succeeds interim rector Charles Bertrand, who was appointed after the dismissal of Patrick Kenneth last year. Lowey is the, the director of the Center of Bioethics at the University of Toronto. He was also the dean of faculty of medicine at the U of T. Dr. Lowey becomes the fourth rector and vice chancellor at Concordia. Fighting robots rolled out of the pages of science fiction and into the hall building last month. They were battling in an annual contest sponsored by the Canadian Aeronautics and Space Institute. Reporter Paul Gott was there. The chase and the kill. Robo Wars invaded the Hall Building March 24th. Thirteen teams entered. Only one would survive. Up to six months' work went into each competitor in a contest that highlights innovation in robotics. But the crowd came for the kill. The mechanical warrior called Out of Lunchbox scared some of the competition right out of the ring. And it eventually rolled off with a $1,000 first prize. For Concordia tomorrow, today, this is Paul Gott. Out of Lunchbox was coached and constructed by Richard Alix. Alix is a technician with Concordia's Faculty of Arts and Sciences. And Valerie Fabricant will not be set free anytime soon. Fabricant is the former engineering professor who killed four of his colleagues in 1993. Last week, the Quebec Court of Appeal refused to overturn his conviction. Fabricant claimed that the original trial judge had cut his defense short. Fabricant had called 77 witnesses when the trial was stopped. He may appeal the ruling to the Quebec to the so, Fabricant may appeal the ruling to the Supreme Court. Concordia student Howard Zhang has lived in Canada for almost four years after immigrating from China. Since then, he has translated three children's books illustrated by his father one of which, called A Little Tiger, has won a national award. Zhang spoke to Katie Schmidt about the books. The appearances of a little tiger were much talked about in the village. It was rare to see a wild tiger then. Why did it not hurt me? Why did it keep coming back? The elders said it was a good omen. Howard Zhang and his father have created three children's books. A publisher suggested the idea for the first book. Through their discussion, she found that uh, just my father's own life is a very interesting story. She said, just write about it yourself and your experience. And uh, that's how we started on this book. The world is in its current trend, coming together as a global community more and more. And there is a very high need for everybody to understand each other. Through their books, father and son want to narrow the differences between their two communities. And for Zhang, the best way to do that is to write about his father's life. Have I been lucky? 
I have certainly been luckier than many of my fellow Chinese. I decided to tell and paint the story of my life to help me understand it. For Concordia Today, I'm Katie Schmidt. Concordia students appreciate candidates who reveal all. Jonathan Carruthers won the student union elections after appearing nearly naked on his campaign posters. His Back to Basics campaign won him close to 900 votes. That's one-third more than runner-up Lana Grimes. There was no voter apathy this year either. Voter turnout was triple the amount of last year, turning out close to 3,000 students. Carruthers succeeds last year's president, Marika Giles. He will assume office on June 1st. Radio CFLI found itself in hot water during the Concordia student elections. The, Lo the Loyola campus station was broadcasting election ads during the first day of campaigning. This is against election rules. The station was ordered to stop running the ads by the chief electoral officer. The station stopped immediately. The DJ playing the ad said he wasn't aware he was breaking any rules. No other area on campus has received as much attention as the Gadangi Lounge. The university administration tried to close it, students fought to save it, and in the end, the lounge was left intact, for this year at least. But one question still remains. Just what is a Gadangi? Thomas Mall wanted to know and began his quest at the Vanier Library. Let's see, we have a Grindstaff, Gringholis, Guadalupe, no Gadangi. So we came down to the Gadangi Lounge to find out what's a Gadangi. This is the Gadangi Lounge, home of cheap coffee and card playing students. Surely the regulars here will know who or what a Gadangi is. So right now you're in the Gadangi Lounge. I want to know what a Gadangi is. Gadangi. Gadangi is three monkeys playing pool in a big seminar. It's a pasta dish who can make it on an Italian menu. Actually, it was. It was used, it's a pirate boat that was used in the late uh, 1800s. Uh, Gdangi is uh, like a mythical animal, like a unicorn. I'd like you to use the word Gdangi in a sentence. Mm, help me out, Gina. Uh, mm, I don't know. What do you think a Gdangi is? Well, a uh, Gdangi is a purple turtle that can be easily toilet trained. Our answer came after a brief search at the archives. Gadangi was actually a first-generation Italian who came to Montreal to study engineering at McGill. 1942, he became Loyola's first engineering professor, and the only one until 1959. It was common practice during the 60s to name buildings after members of the Concordia family. The Drummond Building here was named after a land surveyor turned Jesuit priest turned teacher. For Concordia Today, I'm Thomas Mall. Five Concordia students found a way to combine classwork with charity. They organized a Telemark Ski-a-thon to raise money for the Gary Taylor Center for Handicapped Children. Organizing an event was a requirement for their fitness and sport management class. Jeff Blond was there. More than 20 people took advantage of the great weather and went up to Mount Christie to Telemark for a good cause. For those who don't know, Telemarking is downhill skiing on longer cross-country skis. Catherine Kay and Neil Burnham were two of the organizers of the event. And, uh, we had to do is we had to organize uh, an event and uh, turn it into a charity event. And so here we are, and we're having a great time. But students weren't the only ones having fun. Our four-legged friends were welcome too. And after all the skiing and eating was done, almost $200 was raised for charity. For Concordia Today, I'm Jeff Blonde. Concordia is in a budget crisis, but there are no plans to cut administrative salaries. A provisional budget is being prepared for the May 4th meeting of University Senate, but salary cuts will be avoided according to Acting Rector Charles Bertrand. Concordia's salary policy came under media scrutiny recently. This after it was revealed that ex-rector Patrick Kenneth was given over a half million dollars in severance pay. Concordia's budget is expected to shrink by one-third over the next two years. And Concordia students pounded the pavement last week but they weren't looking for a job. They were trying to rustle up some change and they were doing it for a good cause. Geneviève Nathier has this report. Hoping for some spare change, they cajoled and jangled their coins and begged for money outside the hall building. There were members of a Concordia fraternity raising awareness and money for street kids. It all goes to a good cause. 
The students spent two and a half days sleeping on concrete in a makeshift shelter. It was the third year in a row the fraternity camped out in support of Dans la Rue, an organization dedicated to helping homeless kids in Montreal. Last year, the fraternity raised $6,000, and they aimed to top it this year. For Concordia Today, I'm Geneviève Napier. If you'd like to make a donation to Dans la Rue, they can be reached at 284-5480. Concordia is celebrating a first this year. A course on HIV and AIDS is near completion and students are declaring it a success. The year-long course taught by Tom Waugh is a first of its kind in Canada. Students were required to attend tutorials and maintain weekly journals. They were also expected to do three to four hours of community work per week. The course's mandate was to provide students with a critical knowledge of AIDS in society. And that's your news for this week. For Concordia Today, I'm Annick Lucier. And I'm Sherry Claridge. Stay tuned for a report on The Hive and Reggie's, Concordia's Two Bars. Thanks for watching. Heart disease and stroke are Canada's number one killer. Your donations fund education and medical advances that save more lives each year. Thanks to research, he has a pacemaker. She has a grandfather. Help give someone a second chance. Please give generously to the Heart and Stroke Foundation. It's almost the end of the semester. Exams are approaching and stress is at its peak, but there are places on campus for students to go and relax. The Hive at Loyola and Reggie's downtown. So tell me how often you come here. Well, this would be my first official time, my first beer. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now that a couple of weeks left of school, you find yourself really busy, really stressed out? I was, I'm in the, in the music department, so I was stressed out about the live stuff, you know, which is pretty well going to be taken care of tonight. So after tonight, you know, I'll feel uh, much relief, I would say. So is this beer uh, helping you to relax a little bit? Yeah, yeah, because I'm a little tense, so I'm just uh, cooling myself down a little bit. Yeah. Actually, I've had to go to health services a few times just because I've been so stressed out, like for, uh, for stress evaluations and stuff like that. Does it help you to relax to come here to the Hive and do work? Oh, definitely. I think the music and just the general atmosphere really helps a lot. I can concentrate better usually. Um, do you ever drink between classes or have a beer help you relax? Oh, sure, to relax, especially for those long, extremely long classes. Yeah, no problem. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Do you ever go to class drunk? No, no. Yeah. <laughs> Not this semester. Not this semester? No. <laughs> Last semester, a few times, just because I've been with uh, a lot of friends, and they just, oh, don't go to class, and I, I have to go, so I've been drunk just a few times. Hurry, oh, hurry, I've only got five minutes till the music store closes. The last play of work. Hey, do I tell you how to do your job? Um, well, periodically there's like there's movie night, there's folk night, there's um, Wednesday night is hockey night. Um, Thursday night, I don't know the term uh, they use to describe it, but Thursday night there's bands that come in and play, and normally Friday night um, there's jazz. And then in addition to that, every now and again we'll throw a bash, um, either given by us or by the athletic department or by some organization renting the hall. Why the universities have bars on campus? I think it's basically to uh, fulfill a need. Um, I think I think a lot of students need some lounge space, some space where they can just go and hang out, have a beer, have a drink, a coffee, maybe a smoke, and just relax and study. And a lot of groups come together here, and, um, and they do a lot of their work together here. I think it's just to, to give that atmosphere, to remove the academic aspect and, and put a more social aspect within the university community. Do you ever have problems with students who get too drunk? What, does it ever get out of hand? During regular business hours, no. Sometimes at certain parties, uh, some people drink a bit too much. But we do have uh, 
the student intervention program that all of bartenders are required to take so that we can avoid certain, those instances. Uh, in the past few years, it's gone down considerably, and we have a good security uh, team on for every party where those problems could arise. And uh, so far, we haven't had any serious problems with that. If something does happen, does the bar take responsibility for it? Yeah, you know, we have a, a program in place where we do pay for taxis for people to, to be taken home and uh, if they're not in any shape to, to get home on their own. And uh, so far, we've, we've, I think, done our part. It's sort of a particular concern because in the theater department because it's a bad thing when people come to rehearsals drunk, more so than a class because you have to actually get up and do stuff and remember what you've done. So, and, and I know that a lot of the theater, depart theater students go to the Hive frequently as a way of like afterwards of relaxing and I don't I it's and when hmm, yes <laughs> but people like it's good it's a good thing to have on campus for us for me um, have you ever heard about teachers trying to shut the hive down no no never anyone in the theater department talked about trying to explain <laughs> No, I don't think so. The theater department actually goes as sort of a representative, uh, represent, representation of the theater population. We sort of tend to go to the hive, I think, a lot more. Um, and we even have like our department parties there and everything, and the teachers go, and it's a lot of fun, and everybody's there. And one of my professors bought us a pitcher of beer once. Am I allowed to say that? Well, I think, I think it's really great that we have a bar, actually, well, we have two bars, one here in downtown and the other one at Loyola, because it's, it, you know that it's a place where you're going to meet your friends, and usually the beer is cheap, and it's good, and uh, they play good music. Since we opened from September, of the, we opened in February. It took us four months to get our feet wet to find out what was going on, okay, and uh, and we broke even. From September on, September of '94, '95, September '94, okay. um, up until now, which is April, almost April 1st of '95. Reggie's and the Mad Cafe combined, so the the the, uh, the operations here at Sir George have turned over a profit of over ten thousand dollars a month. Okay, that's not. I'm not. I'm not including the hive, and I'm not including the you know the the bookkeeping services and the rest of them. Just here, okay. Just the operations here. We've been able to cover our expenses and turn over a profit of over ten thousand dollars every month since September. So, um, you think it's a good place to relax? Yeah. Yeah, I do. It's more nice. It's not the same kind of bar scene where you have people hating on you and trying to pick you up, bar fights or whatever. True. Nobody, you're here to do work or you're here to talk or you're here to just relax. It's not, a, uh, it's not an aggressive place, not a rude place, it's just very cozy. And everybody's friendly, right? Yeah. You basically know everybody that's here. Does it help you uh, with your schoolwork at all, like to relieve some of the stress? Yes. <laughs> Heart disease and stroke are Canada's number one killer. Your donations fund education and medical advances that save more lives each year. Thanks to research, he has a pacemaker. She has a grandfather. Help give someone a second chance. Please give generously to the Heart and Stroke Foundation. Welcome back to the program. I'm Annick Lucier, and joining me today is Michel Payard, who's a cyclist with the Quebec road racing team. Welcome, Michel. That's it. 
Um, so being a member of the road racing team, you're also a member of the Quebec Federation, the Quebec Cycling Federation, rather? Yes, I am. Okay. Now, because you're part of the road racing team, does that mean that there are other categories? Uh, yeah, there are three or two major categories and a third, a smaller one. We have road racing and track racing, which is considered a category. And then you have uh, mountain biking, which is sort of upcoming and really popular, which is about everybody now. And uh, BMX, which is a smaller contingency, I guess. Okay, but you're strictly training within the road racing. Yeah, road and track racing. Okay, now what does that training consist of, especially like in the wintertime, we know that you can't really train outside. Uh, well, the bulk of my training I do in that is cross-country skiing. Mm -hmm. uh, we do various types of racing and all that uh, on skis. And uh, then we do some sort of uh, some land workouts, uh, weight training, just to keep uh, strength. And uh, we have uh, sort of a rollers where we put our bikes on, and it's sort of a stationary uh, cycling on okay. a roller. What about in the summertime? In the summertime, all we do is, uh, is we train every day on, on the road. It's just cycling every day, various types of intervals and uh, workouts, but it's on your bike every day. OK, but does that take up a lot of your time? Uh, yeah, it takes up uh, pretty much all my time in the summertime. Mm -hmm. uh, every day I have something to do, so I can't really make long-term plans or anything. Right. How do you juggle, though? You're a physics student. Yeah. Um, so how do you juggle cycling and school? Uh, it's not that bad, because I sort of tend to put all my classes at hours that I know I can't train in. Mm -hmm. And my teachers are usually pretty understanding about the whole uh, situation. So I manage to get by and, uh, and train adequately you know, for the upcoming season. Right. Now, in the upcoming season, what races can we see you in? Uh, well, the important races uh, that I tr like to train for are uh, international stage races like Le Lac Saint-Jean and Beauce. Mm -hmm. uh, those are really big races, uh, like there's several days of racing. Then, obviously, just the national championships and uh, one-day races uh, with a lot of prestige, such as Quebec-Montréal and Ottawa-Montréal. Mm -hmm. Now, are these races strictly, like, would you say that you remain in Quebec or Canada? Uh, yeah, most of the races are in Quebec. Mm -hmm. There are some races that you go to Ontario and even across Canada, there are some big races in uh, BC. Uh, we travel down to the States as well uh, for various types of events if there are better ones uh, than the ones presently here. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but you wouldn't do things like Tour de France? or uh, No, those are professional races. Mm -hmm. Those are actually the highest professional race in the world. Uh, you have to attain a certain level, you have to be a pro first of all, and uh, you have to attain a certain level of uh, achievement I guess and you know years and years of experience. You right. Know. When you become a pro is there a lot of money involved? Uh, there is a lot of money involved mm -hmm. now uh, with sort of the Americans that got involved uh, a few years ago it, it sort of changed the whole aspect of cycling and there is a lot more money involved than there used to be. Would you see yourself becoming a professional cyclist? Uh, not really, it's no. not one of my goals uh, but uh, obviously, it's a nice dream, sort of to, to you know, I want to be a pro, but it's not really my goal. Now, when you're racing, do you still get a bit nervous? Uh, yeah, I think that's my biggest yeah. fault is I get too nervous before a race. Um, it's hard to control my, I don't know, anybody's. It's hard to control your anxieties, or, or uh, uh, even though if you know you're really ready, mm -hmm. uh, you get, tend to get overwhelmed a bit. But you still perform. Yeah, it depends. Yeah. I mean, if it's a really important race, uh, sometimes it won't go as well as you'd like because of stress or whatever. You're not too sure of yourself. Uh, but usually, you know, you get the job done and it works out in the end. Yeah. What have been your past results? Any big championships you've won? Or? Uh, well, I've won when I was at last year junior with the Quebec cycling team. Uh, uh, I was Canadian champion in the team time trial and in the team pursuit. Mm -hmm. And uh, that year I won also the provincial time trial and the provincial uh, team time trial. Right. Yeah. Now with all these awards, would you see yourself in the Olympics anytime soon? Um, yeah, I mean, it's a big goal of mine, uh, the Olympics, I guess, for the year 2000. Uh, I guess it's a goal of any athlete that likes to, that trains really hard, but I'd like to go one day, I guess. It's, uh, it would be really important for me to go. Would it, would that uh, necessitate, necessitate ne excuse me, would that um, entail a bit more training or just the same level of training? Uh, well, it's the same level of training. We don't really change our training patterns just for the Olympics. I guess you just have to get ready for the, pro for the selections for the Olympics and hope that you're going to be on good form and, and that they'll take you. Great. Well, thanks a lot for joining us, Michel. Uh, you're welcome. And that's all the time that we have for this week, but thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next week.